Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Belzer. Uh, today, we're going to be celebrating the one-year anniversary of Ted Lasso's season-slash-series finale, based on who you ask, uh, <laughs> with the discussion of the show, uh, where the show could be headed next, uh, projects cast members are involved in, and, of course, a book that uh, Elise wrote based uh, around Ted Lasso called The Ted Lasso Guide to Relationships, which is available for pre-order Right now, right as I'm recording this. The last time we talked was about Gen V, so this is kind of like the yeah. absolute opposite <laughs> kind of television show from Gen V and the boys. Yeah, no, so, yeah. no, uh, uh, no toxic masculinity, no like e- exploding guts or anything. You know, just a man from Kansas with a mustache telling people how bringing. Kansas City values um, to England. I, I don't know why I blanked on the uh, <laughs> na- name of the one of the biggest country. Well, I don't know one of the biggest, but probably some of like <laughs> it's probably like to- a top ten. But top um, yeah, right, right. <laughs> but yeah, let's just uh, get into it first. I let's start with the series overview. Okay. So, looking back at all three seasons, and I'm also going to include the Christmas. That Christmas special they did. Oh, yeah. Uh, because I was thinking about that as I was w- waking up this morning. I was like, oh, yeah, they did a Christmas thing, too. Right. Uh, so looking back at all the things Ted Lasso, I guess even including the NBC Sports stuff, because it is based off an of NBC Sports um, character that then turned into a TV show. Um, well, out of all those moments in the, in the series, what moment surprised you most in terms of character development uh, or a plot twist. I think one of the biggest, just like shifting moments in the whole show for me has to be when Ted reveals what happened to his father. I think that yeah. is just such a massive moment. Uh, it's in season two in the episode Man City. They go to Manchester and they play, they lose horribly in this game. And there's this beautiful interaction, well, a horrible interaction between Jamie Tart and his dad, James, and then a beautiful interaction between um, Roy and Jamie, just one of the like all time best moments. And then Ted walks outside and calls his therapist, Dr. Sharon, and he tells her that his father died by suicide. And it is just this massive kind of thing. We know pretty early in the show that his father passed away when he was 16, but to have all of a sudden, Oh my goodness, this isn't, I mean, that's already a tragic kind of loss, but to find out, Oh, this is the story behind it was just like, it kind of reframed. I feel like everything with regard to how we saw Ted, at least for me anyway. So I don't know that that to me was just such a massive turning point in the show. Yeah. And I think it kind of set the precedent of the road trip, episodes kind of being the these huge moments for the show for um, sure because even though they had one i think the season before mm-hmm. it, it was just like oh hey let's go out to the club and that's when uh, not todd ted has his first yeah. panic attack <laughs> my brain is just tim tim lasso i mean it's okay because i think that's who what what's on the uh gift basket that he gets whenever he uh goes to his apartment the first time it's welcome Tim Lasso. So yeah, Yeah. it works. I, I, I think honestly, and for, for me, the moments that have stuck out to me the most are the most, um, internet brain rot, uh, versions of, of the thing, (laughs) the thing that you've seen on TikTok. I I love the dartboard scene. I love the one last season where Ted just, can't sleep mm. and he just ends up going to a bar and starts hallucinating. Yeah, that's a great. And, and it, it's just this moment of, oh, he's in deep. Like you already knew kind of first two seasons that he was really struggling, but this was the one where he, it really said, no, we're going to lay it to bear. This is right. him. I, I think kind of the big topic for me for season three was kind of. Let's fix Ted. Well, not fix because that's kind of a weird word when talking about mental health. Um, right. But let's really work on Ted's mental. Yeah, Ted's m- mental health because of how season two ends uh, with, you know, Nate basically saying, oh, yeah, my coach had a panic attack, but 
I'm not going to tell anyone it was me. But yeah, that moment really stuck out to me, at least in season three. I'm sure uh, there's some stuff from season two that stands out, like the uh, Sam Obisanya and Rebecca Walton romance. Sam almost going to a different team. A lot of stuff from season three, just I'm remembering now, um, his restaurant. Yeah. But I will say one thing. Rebecca and Ted should have gotten together. That oh. is like the one thing <laughs> that season three, look, okay, you cannot do that airport scene to me and then just have it be nothing. <laughs> and then just, they're just friends. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. That was a classic 90s rom com. Like, she is chasing down the love of her life. That is the wedding, that is the wedding singer vibes. You can't, you can't play with me like that. Come on. That's uh, fair. So I, I do talk about that in the book. Like, so <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm sure I'm reading it now, by the way. Um, yeah. I'm a few yeah. chapters in. Um, <laughs> but I guess going back to it, still talking about moments, I guess, mm-hmm. or just kind of general overview. I guess we should go back a bit and talk about like, um, what did you think of Ted Lasso when you first started it up? Like, how did you discover Ted Lasso? I know you talk a bit about it in the uh, first chapter of the book. Let's go back a bit and talk about that. Yeah, so it came out, I think, in the summer of 2020. And it it was one of those shows that had, like, a building Mm -hmm. kind of effect. Like, I don't think it came out and was a massive hit the day it, like, dropped on Apple. And, like, but I started hearing people talk about it probably sometime that fall. And I don't know, I'd probably watched everything that I wanted to watch (laughs) at that Mm -hmm. point because, you know, everything was kind of like still in the quiet. We weren't doing a whole lot of going out. My husband and I had like, I think when we bought our iPhones at that time, we got some kind of, I think Apple included like a year of Apple TV for free and we just never activated or whatever because we were like, well, I don't know how interested I am in that. And so we decided, well, let's go ahead. Cause a few people had been kind of, we'd been hearing about this show, Ted Lasso. So I'm certain the whole first season was out when I've started watching. And oh my goodness, my husband is not a television binger. He's like one or two episodes and that's it for him. And we probably watched honestly and truly, if we had, wa- if we had started it earlier in the afternoon, we probably would have watched the whole first season in one sitting. Like it would not shock me. We just pounded through the first season. It was just like, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. And I was just a fan just from the start, like right out of the gate. I loved it. I think the time that I really truly all the way was in and was probably ready for the show to do whatever it wanted to do um, was the episode Tan Lines. It's when Michelle and Ted break up Uh, officially. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I've spent a lot of time (laughs) watching and analyzing Ted Lasso. So if I throw out like episode titles, I apologize. I've just watched this show so many times i've been writing this book for almost a year and working on it so yeah oh, oh, oh no worries i i've kind of like title i have like my own titles for ted last like man city is like the one where everyone cries is man city for me but yeah i i know like even just when you get to the i think it's the third episode where he has the interview with uh Trent Krim. Mm-hmm. And it's really kind of a setup to, you know, Trent's there is kind of this foil for Ted in this moment of like, Rebecca's like, well, I can't get him in this real traditional kind of way. So I'm going to like come this back way around and that Ted, in that Trent is going to be really hard on Ted because he knows he's not a great soccer coach. Like, you know, and so And you get to the end of that episode and it kind of turns on it. And, you know, Trent Krim writes something along the lines of, you know, I I don't think this is going to go well, but I'm going to be sad if it doesn't because I think Ted Lasso is the real deal. And like, even just then, but yeah, when, with the breakup between Ted and Michelle, that was probably where it sold me and probably where I stopped being really a critic or like any kind of like outside observer and just was a full fan. So I will say that I am not super balanced when I talk about Ted Lasso. I love it pretty unabashedly. Like I understand there are some fairly significant issues, particularly 
particularly in season three. Yeah, it has it has some issues. Nevertheless, I am I'm pretty in it and I love Ted Lasso. And yeah, I think watching a breakup that isn't acrimonious and watching a divorce and having gone through a not great divorce myself a while ago and getting to see this other way of it being handled was just so beautiful and so unique and nothing I've ever seen on television, I don't think. And I just, yeah, I've been a fan pretty much ever since. Yeah, there's like no animosity in that moment. It was just right. that pure expression of human feelings that I feel like a lot of, and I won't speak for everyone here, um, because obviously that experience is different from everyone, but I feel like they had last kind of said what a lot of divorcees wanted to say in the moment, but didn't have either the tools mentally. Mm -hmm. And when I say mentally, I mean like they didn't have the the not foresight, but like they didn't know why they failed or if who, you know, anything like that in the moment. And I think a lot of people would love to be able to say, oh, here's where I failed. I failed or no, uh, and I am owning this right now. And I hope you're happy with your life and I'll continue to be in your life because of our kid and we need to be there for him. And yeah, I, I probably could have said that way more eloquently, but I've, <laughs> the coffee has not hit yet. Um, I, I think one of the things that I love about it is there is this kind of stigma attached to divorce still because, you mm -hmm. know, you go into marriage and you expect it to last. I mean, you don't plan for a marriage to fail. And so I think there's this tendency to want to look for a villain in that situation. Yeah. And like, even if there's not really anyone who did anything wrong or it's not even like a bad situation, it's just, over, I think there can be this, well, I've got to find some reason. And I love that that's just stripped from their interaction here. There's not a need to make Michelle a villain or make Ted a villain. It's just two people who got married and loved each other and still love each other in some, you know, in some way, in some mm -hmm. capacity, but it's just not the same. And it's not, I want to stay married to you kind of love. And I, I just appreciated that so much because I, I, yeah, like I said, I, I don't think it's something I've ever seen personally, like tackled in a television show. Yeah. And that's, you know, something that is consistent without the, throughout the show is that at every point where there, I think there's a point in season two where I forget Ted's wife's name, Michelle, um, yeah, M Michelle, like moves on and is in this new relationship and right. she starts watching his games and you think for a moment, like just for a half second, it's like, oh, this could be an opportunity where the writers could have an opportunity to say, okay, let's build the bridge to get them back together. And they don't, which I thought was right. beautiful. Um, because they kind of make it out to, to be like, okay, you, you go watch your thing. And, you know, they make very, uh, a lot of jokes at the uh, significant others experience, but they just let Michelle kind of just Oh, no, I'm in my own life now. They don't ever set anything up, which I thought was really beautiful. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I discovered the show. And to be clear, I couldn't criticize season three at, if I was held by gunpoint. Um, oh, right on. <laughs> um, well, I could, but it, it, it would be <laughs> scathing. And I, I don't think anyone wants to write that, read that review. Like it even hurt writing reviews of the last, uh, I think was it season three of High School Musical, the musical, the series, when I had to criticize it? Because I'm like, <laughs> I love this thing so much. But I right. have to put my critic brain on and say, this is objectively bad. Right. And, <laughs> in my, well, I guess subjectively bad because of the review. Um, right, right. Of the, the things that have to happen in order to, you know, it, it just had failings, as does Ted season three. But yeah, I, I discovered this much in the same way you did, actually. I bought an iPhone. Well, I didn't buy. At least an iPhone 11. And I got that trial. I think it's six months. If, if I'm recalling right, it might be a year. I, I, it's been three years since I looked at it. So Yeah, right. Uh, and I, 
I didn't initially watch Ted Lasso when I activated that trial. I think I watched something else first. I forget what it was. But it I, was that Jason Momoa show. I know. I know. I didn't watch. That. <laughs> I don't know. I know. I didn't watch that. I didn't watch C. Um, no, me either. <laughs> oh, I think it was for all mankind is what I started watching first. That's fair. Because like that was the show that it launched with Apple TV Plus launched with, and. I don't think I got into Ted Lasso until like somewhere in season two. And from there, I, I like binged all the way up till I caught up. I think it maybe took two days to get to mid season two. Yeah, uh, that was that was definitely me. I'm just rolling right through it. And then, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, I, I, I followed it from there and basically said, because I had been reviewing at that point, I, I can't review this because I don't want to knock any of this down. And also, I think there was a concern from me that one of my favorite shows is Scrubs, right? And Bill Lawrence is the creator of Ted Lasso. Right. And I think I was concerned a lot about, well, if I review season two, it's just going to be me talking about Scrubs all the time. That's um, fair. And that's not fair to the people reading. So I was like, yeah. And then when season three came out, and I'm like, okay, this might be something I just don't want to review because... I, I scathing reviews aren't my thing. Um right. so yeah, that 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 that's in a nutshell um how I found out. And I think I found out by word of mouth mostly. I think it was just like around that same time where Animal Crossing and all the pandemic entertainment was mm-hmm. becoming a, like a major thing. I was like, oh well, what's the show Ted Lasso? Oh, it has Jason today. I guess oh it's got Bill Lawrence as the creator. Oh, it has like a bunch of people I know. Okay, all right, let's get into this. And then the rest is history. But getting back to kind of the more broad strokes, this is this is gonna be a tough discussion topic. Yeah, not great so, for the algo here. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> YouTube algo, I'm sorry. I'm not I, I put Spider-Man 2 up and then I gave you this. Sorry. <laughs> We're, we're, we're talking about mental health and emotion. Oh, exactly. But yeah, the show tackles a lot of complex themes. And I think we may have touched on this, uh, but, you know, they, they talk about grief. Particularly, I think you, we already talked about Ted's dad uh, and mm-hmm. how that affects him. Uh, but it also touches on anxiety, uh, particularly how to get help with your anxiety, yeah. um, especially in season two. So how, do you, how did you feel about the balance there of trying to delicately cover these mental health topics uh, while also trying to make a funny show that people could point to and be like, I'm going to make a meme of that. Right. (laughs) I think part of what made it work is they gave us season one first. And I don't mean that, I mean, obviously, but like the tone of season one is overall pretty light like it does talk about divorce there and like that but that's kind of it like we don't delve super deep into a lot of like mental health things until season two like we get a little bit of it in the liverpool where ted's there but we really kind of see it as tied to the divorce and i think that is a broader thing that most that touches on the lives of almost everybody to some degree either you know somebody you've been through it yourself it happened to your parents it happened to a close friend like it feels very close and very relatable and so if you can kind of like come in at it through that of like okay we know that Ted has some issues because yeah when they're at the Liverpool game you know he kind of loses it during the frozen karaoke moment, you know, and so you see him have that panic attack. So we know that there's something going on, but it really does seem to be connected to him signing stuff, you know, his divorce papers. And so there's largely that kind of thing. And I think because they gave us so much goodwill in season one, that when they came at us with season two and it's like, Oh no, this is going to be, a more significant thing. I mean, season two opens up and it's kind of silly, but with, you know, Danny kicking the ball and, you know, ending the, the Greyhound, like there is that sort of moment there where it's like, and they bring in Dr. Sharon, you know, the to kind of help him life. with the yips. Exactly. And so you have this 
Yeah, like, and so people are kind of coming at it and they're like, oh, okay. But then they have this little bit of like hesitancy with Ted seeing a therapist. You know, he's kind of, I don't know about her from the jump. And I think just the way they set up with season one in giving us such this wholesome thing. And we're invested. We love Mm -hmm. Ted at season one, you know, that dart scene, everybody's on board with whatever Ted does pretty much. And so when it comes to season two, and you see all these kind of things happening to him, it, I think we're so on his side at this point that it's not, I think that's what lets it work. Why it doesn't overwhelm the show where it's such a bummer. And granted, like season two got a lot of harder reviews, especially at kind of the midway point where they had the, the Christmas episode is like episode six or something. I don't know. It's like right at the midway point. And those were extra episodes. It was that and beard after dark were two of the extra episodes that, Apple said, hey, we'd like 12 episodes instead of just 10. And they have that extra kind of feel to them. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I love the Christmas episode now. I didn't love it when it came out. And, like, I have grown to love Beard After Dark. But it's a weird episode to just drop right after Man City. It's like, oh, my. It was just a very jarring kind of thing. Uh, It's, like, I think literally at the end of the episode, like, like, Ted asks, Beard, hey, where you are? And he just like kind of shrugs and then takes a nap. And then that's how you start the next episode. And you're just like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> With those pants. It's so good. Yeah. But, but then we find out that Ted, uh, that a beard rather kind of like gets dressed up anyway when he has a night on the town. So who knows? So yeah, it was just, but I think that's how they were able to do it is season one, like it does tackle some things, like some harder issues, but far more relatable things. And I think that way, when you get to season two and you have like some serious abuse issues, when you have some of that, I think it just works better. And like, for me, that's actually part of, I think where season three falls down a little bit is I think what made this show really excellent in seasons one and two is just the, uh, the smaller like personal nature of it. And in season three, they try to tackle these like big ideas and it's, you know, racism and it's, you know, leaked nudes and it's, you know, like some of these big things. And I think because they try to tackle them in this really broad sense, it kind of loses some of what made the first two seasons special. Everything's very small and connected to these characters. And these are like broad social issues that are connected ish. Yeah. to characters but in a in a less I, I think it's a little less successful it's not that I didn't like their take on it I tend to agree with their takes on most of it but having a bunch of guys in a locker room talking about nudes in this you know after school special kind of way it's, yeah, it's just it, not great like it, it, mm, it's even felt if very I'm law and it, order to me yeah even if I'm with it it just didn't I don't know it wasn't the tightest writing I'll say yeah it felt vague enough to where it could have been about anything. Like you could have dropped in any topic, just replaced a few words and it's like, okay, well, if the topic isn't meaningful to the episode, why are we talking about this other than uh, obviously awareness? uh, I think. Right. But yeah, I agree on season three. I, I think it tried to be like, okay, let's try and tie this in a neat little bow for, because we know we want to in, the season slash series, depending on look, the Apple TV plus the season finale. I right. will get into that later. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the way I look at it, season one was like, eight, I feel like 80% humor. And then it's like, okay, we'll t- lightly touch on things from time to time. Like, you know, Ted's divorce. Um, and even uh, Rebecca's divorce. I, I think it t- t- touches, a few on oh for sure but like goes even harder in what season two and the, which kind of brings me to the next point is season two is much more like a 50 50 split between humor and just talking about really serious topics um and then yeah season three just really kind of maybe overplayed its hand a little bit 
it kind of went 80 20 to where it was 80 percent serious talk and like then you got like maybe a joke or two but yeah like you said I, it, it is really broad when it talks about it like i wish while watching the episode about the nudes i wish it would have been like oh my iCloud got hacked and all these other actresses inserts like dozens of other actresses that exist in the world ted lasso also got hacked like people she knows or something like that mm -hmm. because that would have an instant relatability because we all know about the 2013 iCloud hack. Um, I know people who had iCloud hacks over the years. It's mm -hmm. it was insane. So, and you know, it being an Apple show, you could you have the rights to the iCloud name. So, but I mean, I mean, I guess I guess it's called iCloud Plus now, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, like I I think it, that switch i was talking about the 80 20 switch really happened on that away episode what was mm -hmm. that stock uh with, amsterdam. The, with the house amsterdam with the house yeah. and i'm like okay this is really where i'm not vibing with what it's doing because it's just trying to be a little too neat with it and also i think the format changed over the year over each season like i think it started as 22 or 30 minute episodes and then it got to like an hour in season two and then it got to like 90 minutes in some episodes of yeah. season three, which is like, OK, look, if I'm going to watch this every week and you're going to put 90 minute episodes out, just make all of them 90 minutes because it would be like, here's a short little bitty 22 minute uh, thing. And then it's like, here's a 90 minute episode. It, it, it is just wildly inconsistent with runt and mm -hmm. script a, a lot of the time. So, yeah, but yeah. I, I think it handled it really well, I think, because it tried to not never forget about the human element of it. And I think that would be something very easy to forget in a show that is ultimately uh, about a coach teaching an American football coach teaching a English football team. I, I forget what the exact designation, if it's MLS or something like that. But Talking a little bit about that locker room stuff, because I do want to talk talk about that a little bit. I do, I do think what I saw there was with, when they were talking about the nudes, is I think it's in season two, you, over the seasons actually, you kind of see the locker room change. Season one, it's very like men, men will say what men do in locker rooms. And right. who are you to say otherwise? But we're also kind of warming our hearts to Ted. Whereas in season two, they're like, okay, well, we're kind of backing off a little bit. We're, we're absorbing what Ted's lessons are. But in season three, they're like, okay, let's actually stop and consider what's going on right now amongst every member of the team. Uh, which kind of started with the back half, uh, I believe, of season two, where Sam duct tapes the um, logo of Ryan Air, I think it is. And then they replace it with banter or something like that. Right. And I, I think they're there was a real focus on trying to, I, I, I think locker room talk, they really wanted to pin down on and say, okay, we're going to show how a locker room could be. If these mm -hmm. players actually had a coach that clamped down on like, Hey, let's be human beings. Let's maybe not talk about these things. Maybe let's not have nude girls in our locker room. Right. I mean, that's episode one. Yeah. Where, Ted walks up to Jamie's locker and he sees the nude photo of Keely and he puts the piece of tape over it. And it's just, yeah, we get that right at the start. I mean, that's, yeah, I believe that's episode one. So yeah. of the show. So we know the like ethos of Ted Lasso from the top, which, yeah. And I love, I, that is one of the things that I love about the show is the way that that kind of trickles down through the team, through the way that they interact with each other, yeah. you know, that, it, and I, I think that's kind of beautiful and, and it is a little at times aspirational and that's fine. I, I guess that was one of the things that I kind of loved about it is like, yeah, no, there's, I mean, when I sat and was researching like Collins coming out, um, in that episode, like I was kind of shocked at the level of like homophobia that exists in like professional sports. Like oh, yeah. when I sat and like started looking at it and like the number of instances where you'd hear a slur, where you'd hear something like that, it is 
all of it, basically. I mean, it's almost 100% of people have said they've heard this. And so, like, yeah, of course, there's probably not going to be a locker room in which, you know, or a team at all in which you can feel pretty safe that every character is going to be totally fine with you coming out. But I, there was never really, to me, like a problem accepting that in this locker room, that was going to be the case. When there was like this little tease that Isaac's mad, I never really thought it was going to be, oh, Isaac's this secret homophobe. But, you know, that was not my expectation of the show. But I kind of... I, ultimately I kind of love that. That's one of the things that I liked about the show is that it showed us like, this is how things could be. And it's not like we have to eliminate anything. Like it's not like any of these men are not masculine at any point in this show. This is a very masculine show without being toxic. And I think that's just an interesting, yeah, like an interesting and unique thing about it is, yeah. So I think it was just kind of, nice to have like i said this aspirational kind of thing and that never bothered me about the show so uh, and i know that it can be bothersome to some but uh, honestly it it worked for me i liked getting to see things that are nice and one of the things that kind of struck me with that being the like context of the show is mm -hmm. that when you have something that's not nice, even if it's not terrible, because so many shows, if you're going to do something dramatic, it has to be something like terrible. Somebody has to be just a real, like horrible villain. But in this, you know, like Nate being a little bit of a jerk to, you know, Ted at the end of the season, that stands out as like horrific because yeah. Not because he even says anything that's like so awful. We have, you know, most of us have probably been in a fight with somebody that was like at about that level where it's like, oh, this feels really bad. And this person's really good at like knowing your hot buttons to push. Like they can like key you up pretty good. But like that feels like this massive kind of moment when it's really just a fight between two people, like somebody cussing out somebody isn't a huge moment, but it feels like it in the show. And I think it's because so much of the show is just look at how people can be kind to each other. And I think that worked really well too. And again, I think that's where the show kind of like lost in season three is the, the way that the show worked is that everything's at this kind of like even nice keel so that when something is just even a little bit, not that it really stands out and we're able to see how those behaviors kind of like impact people. And I just, I thought that was kind of brilliant the way they did that in the show. Yeah. And I think it, I, th I remember watching, I, I remember watching uh, see the ending of season two where Nate is announced as like um, the coach of uh, I forget which team Rupert Mannion's team. Um, like the enemy team, basically. Like the, yeah, I, mean, it, I mean, I mean, <laughs> the, the colors are black and red. That that's not more Darth Vader. I I don't know what is, but it it felt to me in the moment like, oh, to borrow a, a Kendrick uh, Lamar verse from this week, because that seems to be uh, a big thing uh, that I am very much following. If I understood any of it, I'd write a dissertation on it. Anyways, I, Nate feels like his biggest hater at this moment. It just, like, there's that betrayal of trust. That's what it felt like to me in the moment. Ted had uh, created this kind of really inclusive environment and safe space for a lot of people to just say, hey, say whatever, whatever is on your mind. Just make sure you're considering the other person, basically, is what, is, is what I feel like Ted, the overall message of who Ted is as a person is like, hey, I'm just trying to make you the best versions of yourself that you can be. It's my job. I've got the practice uh, uh, speech in my head. My mind's just constantly running, th shuffling through memes 24-7, uh, especially with this show. I saw the hairy ass uh, TikTok clip the other day. It's like TikTok knows I'm going to talk about Ted Lasso or something. But yeah, it just felt like this huge betrayal of trust. And then, at which I feel like is why season three, you got a lot of fan hate about it. Like how intense it was, 
was because of how Nate was portrayed in season three and his redemption arc. I think anytime you build a fan base like that, it kind of gives way to like uh, fans having somewhat of a ownership over the, the franchise in a way. And yeah, that can be dangerous uh, because if you release something like season three, that isn't up to their expectation. Yeah, everyone who's listening to this has seen probably the public reaction to season three. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> but uh with that, what haven't what haven't we covered about Ted Lasso? Uh, other than you know future speculation, of course. Yeah, there it is. That's the next part. Is where does it go from here? So <laughs> I'll say my theory, and you could say your theory. So, well, obviously that's how podcast works. It goes to it. <laughs> there, Trent Krim publishes a book called The Richmond Way. Healy puts a binder on. Uh, well, man, my brain is. Why do I want to say Regina George's desk? Why <laughs> Rebecca Welton? Basically saying like a women's team of the um of 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 the Greyhound. And so where do we think the story is going? Do you think there's there's a season four? That's just Ted Lasso season four, maybe under like a different title, like the Richmond Way, a spinoff. What what do you think? So I feel like I don't think there's going to be a season four, although I have to laugh literally yesterday as we were preparing to record this, Muhammad posted a uh, photo of like a, basically like a stained glass uh, believe sign on his Instagram because he likes to stir stuff up a little bit. He so does. <laughs> this is like the between, second like, time he's done this. Yeah. <laughs> Like in the wait between season two and three, and especially after season three's finale, like mm -hmm. the man is a villain on social media. He is. That said, I still don't think we're going to get a season four. I would very much be interested to see uh, what they might do with a, a women's league. I think that could be an interesting you know, way to go with it. I don't know. Uh, like, I feel like the series is complete. So I'm not looking for any kind of additional thing. I think Ted going back home, coaching Henry's, you know, little soccer league. That's it. Like, that's the end for me. I'm, oh no, you, we have disagreement here. <laughs> All right, let's go. This podcast is about to be marked explicit. I hated that fucking decision. Like, maybe I... I would understand it emotionally if it had been set up like earlier and like throughout the season, not season, <gasps> but like uh, season two ish. But like in season three, Ted's mom is like, hey, you should go back and be be with your kid. And Ted's like, OK, and just does it. <gasps> and I'm like, no, what? No, literally uh, the first episode of season three. What am I doing here? He's. I, uh, it was, I feel like it's tele telegraphed the entirety of season three that that's where it's going. See, and I even hated that because I'm like, okay, that's where, what, Ted's just going to go back to where he started the series? I, it didn't feel right to me. But mm -hmm. it's just like, oh, he's just going to go back to Kansas City where he knows no one anymore. Like, it's pretty well established that he doesn't talk to anybody outside of Michelle and his kid from Kansas right. City. And I'm just like, oh, so you're just going to, it, it it rubbed me the wrong way, so no, I I do not accept that reality. I oh. in my in my head, Re Ted and Rebecca are married with kids. That but but that's not reality, unfortunately. So um, yeah, I don't know. See, I love Rebecca with with the boatman. Like I, that works for me. I don't know. I love Ted and Rebecca as friends. I think they just. I think there's something. I love their intimate in their friendship and like, I don't know. I, it worked for me. I was, they're really, I was never a big, like, well, I was not a Ted or a Rebecca and Sam no. shipper ever. I was not a, like, that was a storyline. I was not sad to see put down. And honestly, I just wasn't like, if Ted and Rebecca had got together, I wouldn't have been mad at all. I think it could have worked, but like, I don't know. I kind of, I I was never like they've got to get together. So it, to me and 
uh, it felt very cute, the Sam and uh, Rebecca relationship. It just felt very cute, like he was learning how to be in a relationship for the first time, almost. And like that puppy dog love that they had for each other, or actually, well, Sam had for her, and she really didn't reciprocate reciprocate all that much. And apologies, but I'm going to use another analogy uh, of pop culture. It's I've been listening to a lot of Taylor Swift lately. It felt to me like mm. Taylor Swift and Harry Styles with relationship. Like, yeah, it's cute, and they're two successful people, but like, does it make sense? Not really. Yeah, so. uh, yeah. I mean, I think while I was not super on board with that, I think it also just kind of was like, here's Rebecca at a point where she can learn to accept compliments from someone and accept some kind of like love that somebody might love her in a way that is maybe not healthy exactly, but not unhealthy, like the relationship she had with Rupert. And so for me, I think that was kind of the point of that was really just to be like, okay, this is kind of that ability to get through the trauma of being married to an abuser for, you know, whatever amount of time they were married, the like decade they were together. And I think that was the purpose of that relationship rather than to be a long-term thing. And so, yeah, I could, like I said, I'm not like anti Ted and Rebecca. If they had ended up together, I would not have been sad at all, but I am also not disappointed that they didn't. I felt like that could have gone either way. And I was, I was pretty, I was pretty for it either way, but yeah, that's. Yeah. I just, I I just felt like I I was uh, chronically online at the time. So I was like, I need this to work because it it just felt right. And maybe it's because it, it like that was happening, I think simultaneously with high school musical and musical as a series, which also has a really big relationship change. Right, right. And it's just like I can't handle these things at the bo- same time. I can't have two shows lead me on like this, but one one didn't. Um the other did. But uh but yeah, getting back to speculation a little bit. Personally, I think if the, if they wanted to do something with Ted Last, a it wouldn't be um, a season four because I feel like yeah. that would kind of be getting in the way of having it end like the way it does. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I also want to shoot down the any chance of a spinoff because even one called the Richmond Way because I think well, let's talk business. All right. TVs ha- TV shows have renewals, uh, series orders, things like this. If mm-hmm. they were going to put a spinoff show of Ted Lasso, they would have done it the moment the season three finale dropped. Because TV is all about momentum. You want to carry momentum. It's why some people didn't know Invincible. the last half of Invincible season two was out. was because they were just, just so checked out. Like, oh, that's back? Okay. I didn't know this, you know. And if they did this, uh, if they did a season four or even a spinoff, it's at this point kind of just lost profit. And I hate to speak in business terms because I didn't, that's not that's not my world. But it, Ted Lasso was a cultural phenomenon, and when you have something like that, it's important to not lose any momentum or anything like that because once you lose that momentum, what once you People stop talking about Ted Lasso. It, the show's good as dead. I mean, now some shows can survive that, like Young Sheldon and a lot of the CBS and procedural shows that, that are out there. But a show that basically launched itself off a of word of mouth, even though it had some big stars like uh, Hannah Waddington uh, and um, Jason Sudeikis. Yeah, he can't do that again. So it, I hate to say it, but it ain't happening, guys. It's yeah. going to be a year uh, anniversary of the finale at this point in yep. just a few weeks. And yeah, I know that Apple has an event on May 7th, but all, ba- based on the logos, it's going to be all about the iPad. I don't expect anything else, not even a mention of Apple TV Plus other than here's the trailer for what we've got coming next. Right. And, and no, eh. I, I don't see anything happening with the show. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I 
I would be, I would be surprised if they did anything. I, it is odd that they never labeled it a series finale, that it was a season finale. That does leave open all this speculation, but ultimately I just feel like it's done and I'm fine with that. That doesn't, it really doesn't bother for it to be over. So yeah. I think I think it's it told its story. It told it well with a couple of missteps, but overall positive. And I think just leaving well enough alone is the right is the right call. And it's it's done. It stayed like I know when I like sign into Apple TV or whatever. I mean, it stayed in like the top five shows for the past year, like, yeah. which is really impressive because, you know, Apple has had some pretty like impressive television come out in the past year. Yeah. But like, ten- yeah, it is, it is top is the fifth slot on their TV show chart. Right. Still. Yeah. Like that to me for a year out is pretty impressive, which again, is that little bit of like, I guess maybe it could go. I know when I like look around on fan pages, of course people are, you know, please give us a four, but I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with where it ended. I'm, I'm not somebody who, who needs it to, to keep going, but I feel that way. I will admit I am the person who would way rather a show end a little too soon than too late always and forever. If a show's over and I wish there'd be more, I would much rather, (laughs) I would rather, especially if it's complete, I will never forgive Netflix for canceling VOA ever for the whole of my life. The OA is one of my favorite shows. I loved season one. I loved season two that it ends on this cliffhanger will devastate me for Dude, eternity. So that, that that's me. <laughs> and I'm going to get so many like head scratching like comments about this, but I actually really liked true lies on CBS. That was a good, dumb, fun show, and it got canceled right. before it could even finish its season. And it sets up like a season two that would have been killer. Yeah, but but, but apparently it didn't make numbers. It, yeah, and if a show ends at a time where it can end, then I'm I would way rather it be done. And that's very much how I feel about Ted Lasso. Is I love the first three seasons. If that's all we ever get, it ends. I'm good. Like, I'm fine. Yeah, like, I don't need another one. And, nah. like, and I guess we should state the reason for doing it, uh, why they ended it. I think part of it, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, mm-hmm. because you know more than I do about this. <laughs> uh, I don't, like, go too deep dives. But, well, I didn't see it in three. But I, I remember the reason for this being, like, why this was the last season is that Bill Lawrence and oh. Brett Goldstein wanted to move on to shrinking, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so like, if that's the reason, A, a plus. A, and yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, a, well, a, and I think Jason Sudeikis had some like real life Ted Lasso stuff in that his family lives in America and he was shooting in, you know, London and he was like, this doesn't super work for me for being with my kids also. Like I yeah. have this, Ted Lasso kind of thing. And I think Sudeikis has said he's told the story. I I will say with some certainty that if there is anything Ted Lasso going forward, it will not have Jason Sudeikis in it. Like yeah. he, from literally everything I have read, every interview I've seen when he was on Brett Goldstein's podcast, everything that I have listened to, He's done. He's not Ted Lasso anymore. So, yeah. and without Ted, I don't know. It feels like it would be hollow. And I'm, yeah, like yeah, I'm it, just not interested in it. Yeah, it'd be like Joey. Exactly. Joey's a great character. He's super fun in the context of friends. Like, I love all of the coaches. Like, yeah, if you give me a show with like, you know, Roy and Nate and Beard doing a thing, it'd be fun, but it'd be missing something. And I'm just, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm good. So yeah. And I think, yeah. I think, I think, I think it's over. So that's, yeah. But and, I don't know. But it, yeah. And even if they were to do a spinoff at this point, like the three routes they set up, like it just aren't interesting to me. It, it, the Richmond way ones like, okay, yeah, now, Trent Krim and it was actually truly independent and just writing books and doing whatever he loves. So you don't need him in the series anymore. Um, 
Nate uh, is now head coach, I think, at or one of the coaches at uh, Richmond, but along with Roy and uh, Beard. I, no, I think Beard goes back. Does no Beard stays. Beard stays, and like that just would feel like, at least to me, a rehash of what they already talked about with Nate's redemption and. It would kind of almost feel like Ted Lasso season one again. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we can yeah, skip that. But yeah, like it would just feel like a, a, it would just feel like Ted Lasso season one. And it's like, if I'm going to watch something that feels like Ted Lasso season one, I'll just watch Ted Lasso season one. But um, yeah, that's very much how I feel about a lot of things is like, well, why don't I just watch the thing that I already like? That's fine. Yeah. And then really briefly, I do want to recommend uh, Shrinking. Uh, which is Bill Lawrence's current project. I it, it's got uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting uh, Jason Siegel, Harrison Ford, and uh, two actors. I can't remember the names off at the top of my head. I know Brett Goldstein's involved with it too. Yeah, I think but he's, he's not on one screen. of the writers. Yeah, yeah, he's like writer, and I think one of the producers. I would watch. Yeah, Jessica that. Williams is in it. She's so good. Yes. Oh, I love her so very much. good. Uh, so. <laughs> If you're looking for more Ted Lasso stuff, I, I feel like Bill Lawrence has the same voice across all of his projects. So either totally go watch Drinking if you still got Apple TV Plus or, you know, Scrubs is on Peacock and basically everywhere. So why not rewatch that for the 40th time, you know? Yeah, exactly. And he's got a few other projects, but um, and films to be buried with with Brett Goldstein. Uh, oh, it's so fun. And I do want to mention... Yeah. Hannah Waddingham's going to be in the new Mission Impossible. Yeah, I saw. I just saw her. I just got a chance to uh, finally watch uh, the Fall Guy, and she is oh, oh, so lovely. Oh, yeah, it? that I love too. It. She's so good. Yeah, yeah. With her, well, she has the brown hair and the like producer glasses. So yeah, yeah we have that going on. But she is she is a delight in that as well. But, on that, yeah. I guess apparently Christo Fernandez, who plays Danny Rojas, is going to be in Sonic Three this year, which <laughs> I have so many questions about. Uh, he was, I think, he was also in. Was he in Venom? Yeah, I think he was in Venom. I think he was the bartender. He would. He yeah. was. I don't know if he was in that. I know he. No, that was, was no way in home. the cameo at the uh, end. Oh my gosh, it's the one I can't even remember. Was it No Way Home? I think it's No where, Way Home. Where Tom Hardy's Venom uh, is like drinking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Christopher Fernandez uh, is explaining like, yeah, there's a Spider-Man, but, you know, <laughs> explaining all the different things that have happened in the MCU. Uh, and then uh, uh, lastly, uh, Keely Juno Temple yeah. is going to be in the new Venom. Yeah, so, no, I'm like Juno Temple. She is. I love that she is this almost entirely dramatic actor and they called her in to do this, you know, comedy show. And she is so brilliant. Like her comedy chops are so good in this. And that they were able to see that from somebody who almost exclusively does and did, you know, prior like dramatic roles. I just, I think she's so great. And yeah, it's, a, it's the, the only reason that I wish there had been more of the show is that I just wish more of the, actors had chances to win awards because like literally Nick Muhammad gives some of the most beautiful like performances. They're so good. Phil Dunster gives, mm -hmm. I mean, Oh my goodness. Like he is so fantastic as Jamie and like comedy, but like these, some like really truly deep, beautiful moments with him. And I'm just like, I'm bummed that, you know, they didn't have chance to, yeah, win awards. That That's like should have been his. truly. I mean, it really should have. Like, I love Jason Sudeikis. I think he's great, and he also. I have to like point out one of to me the funniest moments in the whole of the show, and like where I would give him all of the comedy awards is Jason. Ted goes into Doctor Sharon's apartment to take her uh, bike back after she's in an accident, and she's like can I get you something to drink? And he takes a glass of tap water and he stands there and he drinks this glass of tap water. And it is to me, one of the first moments on television, just the little, like he does it all in one take. He drinks the whole glass in one take. I don't know. Something about it is just 
so deeply funny to me that you're standing there in the apartment of somebody who is deeply uncomfortable with you being there and you just stand there and you just drink this whole entire glass of water and it has the little like drinky sounds. It is perfect. And thank you, Jason Sudeikis, for giving that moment uh, because I know he's listening to the podcast. Yeah. He's watching it right now. So I'm, I'm I appreciate popular. it. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Me too. So <laughs> like, I appreciate it very much, Jason Sudeikis, that you gave us that drinking water scene because it is just one of my all time favorite moments in the show. I've watched it so many times because I think it is utterly hilarious. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. brilliant. Yeah. He has a lot of gags with drinking water or drinking thing, just various things throughout the series. And I I almost thought the gag there, I'm trying to think back to the scene, it was like, oh, this is actual water. I'll drink it because I don't have to spit it out because it's not. Because he does all the spit takes with the, the sparkling water. So, oh, so good. All right. So let's talk about your book, The Ted Lasso Guide yeah. to Relationships, which is yes. on, on pre-order now on a a Amazon, I believe. Uh, yeah, Amazon. Okay, cool. I'll include a link in the description just so that everyone can get get the copy, get the book. So your book focuses on four kinds of relationships, romantic, coaching, parenting, and friendship. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's talk about that. What, why did you pick those four tenants? And yeah, how do you explore that in the book? However you want to answer that. So when I look, I mean, I think those are a little bit of just kind of how we have relationships in the world too. And so I really wanted to do that. But I think that the show I know they've talked about, like Jason Sudeikis in particular has talked about, like he really wanted to focus on like mentoring and coaching and that kind of thing. And then I just, I love the friendships in the book. I love the friendships between the team. I love, you know, between Keely and Rebecca is just one of my favorites. I love all the different kind of romantic relationships and the way that it just explores them in different ways. Like, they're not, it's kind of funny because at the end of the show, you don't have Ted and Rebecca together. You don't have Roy and Keeley together. You don't have a lot of the people you expect to be together at the end of the show. But I kind of like, even though like, yes, I desperately wanted Roy and Keeley uh, to end so up together. Much. Like that's one of the oh, tragedies of the show. But I also love that Keeley's like, you know what? I'm going to do what's best for me. I'm not going to sit here and pick between these two people. I'm going to do what makes me happy and what is healthiest for me. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing that at the end of the show, you don't have to, you know, and in life, you don't have to have a romantic relationship to be fulfilled. And I love, you know, you have Leslie and Julie, like the Higgins is, and like they're married in real life. I love that. And how much of the dynamic that they bring to it. And I think honestly, one of the like healthiest people in all of Ted Lasso is Leslie Higgins. Here's yeah. somebody who, I mean, he's goofy and silly, but like he is Ted Lasso before Ted Lasso ever existed in their world. Rebecca yeah. had a Ted, she had Leslie. And like, I think it's kind of interesting. He's goofy. He's like kind of an oddball kind of person, but he's like, he cares about her. He cares about the team. He's sympathetic. And I just think it's, interesting you know to kind of look at all of these different things in in the show and like parenting is such a big thing that's so we see that through so much of it that you know the loss of a parent was had a huge impact on how ted you know lived the whole rest of his life past being 16 and that matters and like his relationship with henry is what you know, kind of compels the end of the show. And, and you see the relationships between Rebecca and her mom. And so there are so many, and like a big part of the book is talking about like Jamie and, and his dad and honestly, Nate and his dad. Like there are just a lot of parenting relationships that inform so much of how the characters are developed. And I think it's kind of interesting that we don't just see that kind of all entirely off screen that some of that's brought on screen. And again, I think that's one of those interesting things that you don't often see in shows. And so I think that was kind of where I started thinking about, well, how do I want to structure? I, I know I love this show. I know I'd like to write about it, 
but like, how can I structure this? And I started, thinking, you know, you just have ideas. And, yeah. and so it's like, okay, but a book has to have some kind of structure. And so I was like, okay, well, let's look at all of these characters, but through the lens of these, you know, relationships that they have that are shown on screen. And I just think that's kind of interesting. So I hope that it is interesting in the book. I think it is. And one of the things that I did in each chapter is I try, even if we're talking about parenting broad, I try to talk about different aspects of that. So like having a relationship with your older children, like if you're an adult, a parent to adult kids or, you know, as a kid trying to relate to your adult parents, how do you do that? you know, through the lens of like Ted and Dottie or Rebecca and Deborah, you know, those kind of things. And then also how do you parent like a little kid or how does an abusive parent impact, you know, going forward and those kind of things. So it's not just parenting broad, but like I try to go through specific kind of things and that's for each section has that kind of deal. So, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 um, from my experience so far, it's, using the show to kind of like, like, Hey, let's talk about the specific moment and here's how it can apply to these situations. Right. Uh, yeah. That's, that's the goal. It's a little self helpy kind of book. Yeah. I Look, I've got, I've got so many of those I've got a, And you know, I can't say that I'm not a book nerd when I've got like the MLA, the Chicago um, psychological association uh, style guy, two different dictionaries, two different uh, like, I've got a just stack of things here. So exactly. And we all know. And books my, play, go ahead. No, I was going to say books play in so much in the show. I mean, like yeah. right out of the gate, you have Ted gives all of the players a book. And the first thing we see is Ted on the plane reading and, you know, beard on the plane reading, like reading and books are a huge part of just the, the show itself too. Yeah. And I think there was, one point in the show where it um, specifically mentions a book in the episode's title and says, oh, you you didn't read the book and that's why you misunderstood this. Um, I think it was like some like a, a play that they messed up and um, the book was the key to understanding that or something like that. <laughs> now I'm thinking of Jamie Tart again. Um, but yeah, and kind of leapfrogging from there let's talk about i know it's kind of a huge leapfrog moment um but let's talk about how the show talks about found family how, how do you explore that in your book you know and how did you want to showcase that in your book i think one of the biggest moments where that is very like explicitly talked about is in the Christmas episode, which like I said, when it first came out, I was like, well, it came out in the middle of the summer. So it doesn't feel Christmassy yeah. for me living in America where it is winter when it is Christmas. I imagine to Australian viewers, it might've felt a little more, you and, know, and let's specify which Christmas <laughs> episode. Cause there are two. Are there two? Yeah, they did a Christmas episode and then like a Christmas special, which was like claymation. Oh, where... yeah. No, I'm talking about the full episode. They yeah. do have the claymation episode, but or, you know, little short kind of thing. I'm talking about uh, with uh, Ted's missing mustache. No, I'm talking about the full episode that dropped in the middle of season two and is kind of an awkward episode, yeah. but it's a lovely Christmas episode if you watch it kind of outside of the context of the rest of the show. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. But there's a scene where Leslie talks about how he always ha invites the, you know, players who can't go home to his home for Christmas. And this year, because, you know, Ted's been kind of fostering this close relationship with the team, almost all of them show up at his house and he gives this like lovely toast at the end and he mentions, and it's kind of neat because, um, uh, uh Jeremy Swift mm -hmm. mentions like all of the places where both the actors and the characters are from like all of their different like homes, which is kind of lovely. And then he's like, you know, to the family you're born with and to the family that you find along the way. And I just think I love that scene. I love that. Yeah. Again, they have this kind of friendship that is more than, you know, 
it, it's something deeper. And I don't want to say that like friendship is an only kind of thing and family is of like greater importance or whatever. I'm not, I think that's very much what this shows is that yeah. we do still have this like longing or craving for this like group that we belong to that feels familial, I guess. And they do that so beautifully. And like I said, they do it throughout the show, but that scene in particular, I think is just really, really lovely. And and that whole episode really kind of explores that. So yeah, so that's probably the one that I talk about the most in the book. Yeah, it, it's it is a lovely episode. I you're getting me to want to rewatch Ted Lasso, <laughs> which is a dangerous prospect. Because I feel like I'll go through like the five stages of grief when I hit season three. So let's get back to Ted Lasso, the person, the character. What do you think makes him such a compelling character? What, what makes him such a compelling character that you wanted to base a whole book off of? Yeah, I think, again, it's just this idea. Generally speaking, I am somebody who really likes the heavy prestige drama kind of shows those tend mm -hmm. to be my favorite like okay. if i'm comfort watching tv it's succession <laughs> or it's breaking bad i like the bad man tv shows and i just do and i'm fine with that but it's interesting to me to have this here's this character who isn't that who's nice and i don't think we get a lot of just nice characters that don't have some kind of underlying darkness or whatever and like he's just nice and that's it and like he does have there's a complexity to him of course but at his core it doesn't change his decision to be kind to people to want people to be the best versions of themselves and that is deeply compelling to me because I think we want that I, I think that's what resonated so heavily with this show. Why a year past it being off television, it's still like in the zeitgeist to at least some degree that, you know, you can throw up a believe sign and people are like, Oh, what yeah. else could happen? You know, I, it's that kind of thing. And I, I think that's because these are characters that feel real yeah. In a way, it, but in a very different way than other characters. I've watched shows and and been like, yeah, I can I could see these people existing out in the world, but like there's something a little heightened about them. And there's something, of course, heightened about these ones too, but it's in such a like different way that I just I don't know. I it really I appreciate it so much and I I love that it exists. I love that it's something we got to watch. So I, I think first. Uh, I, I think it like it speaks to the show a lot um, that I wanted to start watching football. <laughs> like I almost I hovered over that MLS season pass subscribe button a few times um, and almost bought the season three. Like um, they made like um, out uh, not outfits, um, uniforms, banter uniforms that you could buy on the Apple store. And I'm like, look, <laughs> I might I might make a risky financial purchase if these uh but uh but cooler hail heads prevail on on both of those there you uh, go. <laughs> but i think it's a testament to the show that i even wanted to do that i was like oh let's see what the show like the show like see if i can find a team you know so that he has a team but we're not good but um i i, I think second um gosh what what was the last thing you said so I can remember my point? Oh, just about like the heightened reality of them, but in a nice way, in okay. a different kind of way. That that was enough to kickstart kick start the brain go. train. So I think the reason they feel so real, these characters, is there's a world around them not mm -hmm. that's not central to them. Like, yeah, to us, Danny Rojas is important. And... But like there are other people you where you know you see the extras who are just never get in a line, but there's like hundreds of people uh in in a scene at sometimes, maybe mm -hmm. even thousands. And I'm not talking about 
just the football games. There, there will be shots where Ted is walking down the streets and you can see some all, all manner of people and they have their own stories and you can imagine those based on the world that Ted Lasso created because we even get into the interior lives of, you know, hub mates and um, football announcers and independent journalists. And, you know, we go past just Ted Lasso and the football players. It's right. the management, every aspect of it. And I think that's what makes it feel, at least for me, so real is mm -hmm. when um, characters feel like the most important thing in the world. Like, I hate to start to keep using the MCU example, but like, let's use a streaming show example. And in The Winter Soldier, the reason it does not work for me that I'm supposed to, and spoilers for the show, by the way, um, it's a four-year-old show at this point. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't want spoilers, just tune out for like the next five seconds. You can't make me care about a character whose entire life happens off screen yeah. um, where that's not been set up and I, I can't root or not root for that character because I don't know what her world is like. And bringing it back to Ted Lasso, it's just like, oh, no, it makes sense that, you know, the football announcers react this way. The pub mates react this way because we have context about their situation. I mean, when we last see Jamie's dad, we, we don't just see him alone watching a football game, right? Because that would be what an insular show would do where it's just focusing on the characters that are important to us, the, the mm -hmm. viewer. Instead, it's like, oh no, he's in rehab. And here are all the people watching the game with him. Right. You could see people in that background that don't even look at the camera, you know? So, and I think that's a pretty good rule to follow just in general for making a store, uh, world feel real with characters is just not making the, the central part of the universe like we thought the Earth was so many thousands of years ago. Right. Or maybe not thousands, maybe just hundreds. But yeah, that's been my TED Talk. But Here's a fun one um, to close it out. So a big thing in the show is Ted giving biscuits to Rebecca and other members of the team. Uh, imagine you can have a biscuit with one character for the show. Who would it be and why? Oh, I mean, I feel like it would have to be Keely because I love her so much. She's the character I wish I was like. I think I'm more like Rebecca in that I am. I don't know. Yeah, I, but I love Keely so much. She's just, mm, she is delightful. And I would just love to sit and listen to her stories because she has done so many things and I would like to know more about them. So yeah, Keely. And also in real life, Phil Dunster. <laughs> because I just love him. Especially if he can like just put on his Jamie Tart voice and say, poopy. It'd be lovely. <laughs> but you know, Poupe. but honestly, there I. It is. Uh, it's very hard to pick, but I probably want to like have a cookie with with Keely because I just love her. So. That's a good pick, and you made me realize something. Humble, the the real life counterpart of Banter, obviously the right. parody. I forgot that when the show was happening, season three was happening. They ran like a thing where it like turned into Banter. Uh, oh, I, nice. I forgot I did, participated in that. Wow. <laughs> Wait, but yeah, as for me. I feel like it's a three-way tie. Like, I wouldn't want to have a biscuit with Ted Lasso because I feel like you'd talk my ear off. Like, I, I, I would just want to, like, enjoy the biscuit, you know? Especially if he made it himself. Actually, no, he... D I can't remember if he does. I'm going to have to rewatch the series. I, because I remember in season one, like, there's that whole subplot of trying to track down uh, what shot makes him. Uh, yep, and we so, find out that it's him. He's okay. the one who makes her biscuits every day. Yeah. Okay. Which, again, come on. It's just man. nice, man. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's a three-way tie between um, Jamie Tart, Keely, and it would probably be Roy Kent if I'm being all serious. Because I just want to, like, joke with him and see his reaction because I feel like he'd be a good... Like, if I was planning a stand-up routine, I could go through my iCloud notes and be like, all right, well, let me try some a few. Let me try a few jokes with you really quick, and he'd just be so annoyed. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and also I'd just kind of be like, 
Do you have a hairy ass? Do you? <laughs> Why didn't your locker room uh, stand for st- stand up to you uh, for you? Um, but yeah, I I feel like you would be the one. Um, but I'm most like Nate. Um, oh, I could see that. Um, I'm very like introverted, so I'm just like, okay, leave me. I have peopled enough. I will go into my dark den of a uh, hole, and I will um play Madden for the next four years. No, um, but I will say Nate is probably my favorite character on the show. I love. I love his arc and I know people are mad and feel like he should, they feel like his anger came out of nowhere and they feel like his redemption arc was not earned. And I just wholly disagree with all of that. And I could do like a whole nother hour, literally just talking about how much I love Nate. I love Nate. Nate is far and away my, I think he is the most interesting character on the show, but all that said, I'd still want to have a cookie with, with Keely. (laughs) Yeah, I, I feel like she'd be fun. I feel like yeah. that could be like a brunch date almost. Like, I feel like exactly. it couldn't just be like a biscuit. It, it would have to be like a full meal, you mm-hmm. know, like yeah. a two, three hour, like sit down restaurant. We're having like two courses. I don't know. But yeah, that would have to be like a whole thing. <laughs> but yeah, on the Nate stuff, I would just encourage anyone um, who's kind of iffy on that whole storyline to kind of go back and rewatch it, uh, rewatch his whole, that the whole series really, uh, yeah. two or three times. Um, because I think I read some pieces that came out, um, once that started up, once that, I think the season series ended, um, that really went to analyzing Nate and it made me understand it a lot more because initially I was that yeah. person who was like, Oh yeah, I don't really like it. It came out of nowhere. But then when reading about it and like, I think there was one line I read about like Nate spits in the mirror because he hates himself. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't respect your game. All right. Right. But yeah, yeah. I just recommend that. Uh, and it sounds like I'll probably end up rewatching Ted Lasso in the wait for shrinking season two. I'm probably scrubs again too, because why not? I've, seen it so many times all eight seasons of scrubs yeah all eight. <laughs> there is not a night. all eight seasons of scrubs <laughs> you, you know what's going to be really funny about As a that note. <laughs> is donald Faison and um zach braff have a rewatch podcast for scrubs i hope they never cover season nine i hope they just like ended at season eight like it just yep that it just ends there and it's like and then everyone's waiting for the next episode and uh there's just like there's like a two second clip uh of Zach Braff just talking into the microphone. It's over. That's what I'm looking for. Or uh Bob Kelso just saying did you uh like what what did you think you're gonna get a ninth season? Um or something. I don't know, Bob <laughs> I, that's a uh, thank for another time, but uh, I could talk about Scrubs all day. All day. But with that said, um, I want to thank you, Elise, for uh, joining me and discussing Ted Lasso, your uh, upcoming book, Ted Lasso Guide to Relationships. Uh, I'm currently working my way through the 170 pages, I believe. Round about that, yeah. Round about that. I mean, I'm not making concessions for like title pages and stuff like that. So it's probably <laughs> yeah, somewhere around there. And to listeners or watchers, however you're interacting with this podcast medium, uh, thank you for watching or listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a rating if applicable. I know Spotify, you have to sign in to do that. iTunes, uh, you don't. Um, and review it on whatever podcast app that allows you to. And then if you want to hear the next episode before anyone else, my patrons get early access. $3 a month gets you access to everything. Uh, well, at early access at least. And then if you bump it up just a little bit to, I believe, I I believe $10, uh, 10, you get unedited uh, episodes. And that's exclusive to members of that tier. Um, And then you can follow me everywhere. uh, Awesome B media, whether that's blue sky, Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon or thread. Um, And if you like letterboxd, um, I'm on there. uh, Austin B movies. I'm also on serialized. Um, as Austin B. Media. So, yeah, if we're there, 
Uh, where can people follow you on social media, Elise? Most places just at Elise Chaffins uh, with two hard names to spell. So it's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's most places. Yeah, I'm I'm have accounts basically everywhere. I am most active on TikTok um, and Instagram and Oh, Barbara says Facebook is for old people and racists. I am on Facebook a fair bit, and that's a good place to find me. I'm I'm old, so we'll say that I try not to be racist. So, you know. <laughs> but yeah, if you look for Elise Chaffins, you'll find me. I think I'm about the only Elise Chaffins in the world. So yeah, you're, it you're makes the first it one that pops easy. up. Easy. <laughs> but um I, I do have a TikTok account. Uh but there you go. Wh- who knows for how much longer. Yeah. Uh, oh. With that said, uh if uh, if you have any favorite memories uh, of Ted Lasso, I'd love to hear them on social media, uh, the Patreon community chat, or uh, if you're listening to this on Spotify specifically, I'll have a question in the little um, Q&A about, uh, that you should be able to type in an answer for. But until next time.